Hello, my name is Jesse Burbank, and I'm a member of the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics, and thank you for attending this evening's program. The Dole Institute Student Advisory Board is composed of KU students committed to the work of the Dole Institute. We attend regular meetings, assist in events like this, and plan an SAB-sponsored program every semester. Members of the SAB receive great opportunities to network with our special guests. If you are a student and would like to join, please contact the Dole Institute. The Dole Institute would like to hear from you. If you enjoy this evening's program, please let us know by contacting us on Facebook, Twitter, or through our website email. Your attendance and feedback help shape future programming. To view past presentations, visit our online video archive at www.doleinstitute.org. A video of tonight's presentation will be available on our website soon. Before we begin tonight, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. After the interview, we'll have some time for audience questions and answers. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student helper with a microphone will come to you. Please ask just one brief question. <laughs> Finally, if at any time during the program you have difficulty hearing, please alert one of our staff members or student volunteers here in the hall and they can assist you. And now, please welcome Associate Director Dr. Barbara Ballard. Thank you, Jesse. Please give him a nice round of applause to our student, please. Thank you. Thank you much. Well, I'll say good evening and welcome to the Robert J. Dole Institute of Politics at the University of Kansas. We're pleased to have <coughs> you join us for this presidential lecture series. And you know the title, The First Lady's Intimate Sacrifice and honored posts with Richard Norton Smith. I would just like to ask you to turn the back of your program just briefly so that you know tomorrow evening, if you happen to be new and you haven't looked there, that we have another program tomorrow evening, Trailblazers and Traditionalists. And look at our study groups and the other programs that we have. On February the 17th, you learn more about Mary Todd Lincoln and her sisters, Lucy Hayes and Frances Cleveland. Tonight, you will hear more about the Wilsons and the Roosevelts. The 2014 Presidential Lecture Series is sponsored in part by the William T. Kemper II Charitable Trust and Commerce Trust Company and Bob Lloyd, co-trustees. This evening's interview will be conducted by Bill Lacey, Director of the Dole Institute, Richard Norton Smith, as you know, was the first permanent director of the Dole Institute and is a noted presidential historian. If you're new and you are not familiar with him, please take the time to read the front of the program. Richard is also a regular guest and we're very honored every time he can come to the Dole Institute of Politics. With that, I would ask you to please give him a very warm Jayhawk welcome. He certainly has earned it. <laughs> Bill Lacey. <coughs> You might also offer Richard some applause tonight because he's uh, virtually finished with his uh, Rockefeller book, which is like 10 years in the making. The emphasis is on virtually. Uh, <laughs> I thought I was finished, and then I, I learned you know, I have 1,500 footnotes that have to be completed in the next two weeks. So uh, anyway. So I shouldn't announce that it's going to be published this fall. No, it, it is scheduled to be published in November. And 14 years of my life have, uh, yeah, well, it's a big life. Well, we hope we can get you That's back it. to talk about it. And that was just all the women. I mean, you know, 1,200 pages, <laughs> the big book. Anyway, I didn't say that. All right, let's, uh, uh, let's start tonight with the McKinleys. Uh, t tell us a little bit about the president and Ida McKinley and, and how his assassination affected her. Well, it's interesting. There, you know, it's interesting how popular cultural norms uh, evolve. At the time, the McKinleys were uh, beloved. Um, the president was uh, lionized as someone who was almost saintly in his devotion to his invalid wife. 
Today, she's looked upon as kind of a harridan, um, you know, someone who was uh, burdensome and nagging and self-centered. A um, hundred years ago, she was seen as a almost saintly victim. Um, McKinley's reputation has, has undergone really almost a revolution in the last few years. Um, it, you know, this is a man, the last president of the 19th century, and, and worse than that, the, the precursor to Teddy Roosevelt, which means he's been overshadowed. Uh, plus, he encouraged that. I mean, he was, he was not a swashbuckling figure. Uh, the McKinleys didn't have a, a, a White House full of children to entertain the nation, as did the Roosevelts. And um, he was a much more, much more like an Eisenhower figure, a hidden hand president. And yet he is the man who, who really took America onto the world stage. Not only the Spanish-American War, which he entered somewhat reluctantly, but you know, um, the Vietnam generation, it was William McKinley who, without consulting Congress, sent 5,000 troops to China to help put down the Boxer Rebellion. That was a remarkable display of executive power uh, at that time. Mrs. McKinley, um, through it all, insisted on being part of uh, all the White House social events. Um, it was, frankly, somewhat awkward um, when, because of her illness, um, she would, people who were there, William Howard Taft was a guest, and he left the most vivid description. Um, he, he suddenly, he looked over. First of all, the President and Mrs. McKinley were seated next to each other, which of course you would not do under normal circumstances. That was because of how protective McKinley was. Um, she would have a seizure in the middle of a dinner, and there would be a hissing sound emanating from her rigid face. And the president would wordlessly, uh, as uh, unobtrusively as possible, and from long practice, whip his dinner napkin out and drape it over his wife's face until the, uh, the seizure passed. And she resumed often in mid-sentence. Now, you can imagine, um, this was a stuff of gossip. Uh, I mean, once you saw it, you probably didn't forget it. And McKinley was, um, you know, McKinley was a man in love all his life. Uh, I think he was in love with, you know, the bank teller who he had met and married in Canton, Ohio. Um, he told the vice president's wife, oh, you know, if you could have seen Ida when she was young. She was so beautiful, and she was. But the, the, the fascinating thing, the key to McKinley's character, and maybe to Ida's, is that he never lost that picture of her. And um, when he was governor of Ohio, there wasn't a governor's mansion. They lived in a hotel across from the state capitol. And every day at 2 o'clock, McKinley would drop whatever he was doing, step to the window, and wave to Ida, make sure she was OK, and vice versa. Um, it, it, was a, it was a real love match. Um, but it tended to get, as I say, overshadowed by the, by the far more colorful um, and uh, press monopolizing Roosevelt's. Well, let's go ahead and, and talk about that. I mean, would you think it's fair to say that Edith Roosevelt revolutionized the First Lady's role? She, she transformed the White House. Uh, there's no doubt about it. She certainly revolutionized the White House. Um, if you, you've seen pictures of the White House in the Gilded Age, uh, you know, the stereotypical potted ferns and um, stained glass screens and, you know, stuff today that people would, I mean, is worth a fortune, got carted out when T.R. became president. I mean, tastes change, um, sometimes abruptly. And it was somehow symbolic of the new era that this new first lady decided to transform the house to make it a residence, first and foremost. Remember, the Roosevelt's had all these children. They were bringing, they had a horse named General Grant, who they would bring in and take up in the elevator to the second floor to entertain one another when, you know, if they were ill. I mean, not since the Lincoln children 
was America so um, entertained by a presidential family? Now, Edith, um, who of course was the second Mrs. Roosevelt, people forget, Edith and, and, and Theodore had been playmates. They had been friends uh, as children in uh, New York. And uh, something happened um, to come between them because when he went off to Harvard, he almost immediately fell in love with a ravishing young woman named Alice Lee. And they were married, and um, Alice had a namesake daughter and died the same day as T.R.'s mother under the same roof. And that's when he abandoned politics and went out to North Dakota uh, to become a rancher. Um, and, but, but it's interesting because Edith Caro was still available. And it wasn't very long before uh, the flame was rekindled and they were married. And um, it's an awful thing to say, but which has never prevented me from saying it. Um, <laughs> Edith was a much more appropriate wife, and I think first lady. Um, you get a sense with Alice that there was a kind of childlike quality, almost a doll-like quality, if you know what I mean. Edith was sensible. Um, she understood that living with Theodore Roosevelt required a certain... Uh, uh, well, she certainly, she was part of the strenuous life herself. She once famously said that she had six children, of whom Theodore was the eldest. <laughs> um, and uh, the interesting thing is, here we are at the beginning of the 20th century. The world is being remade. America is the great world power. Daily life is speeding up. Um, new inventions, new ways of getting around, new ways of communicating. So what does Mrs. Roosevelt do? She takes the White House back 100 years to the federal era. George Washington, who never lived in the White House, could have walked into Edith Roosevelt's White House and, and recognized the place. Out went um, the screens and the ferns. And of course, where the uh, West Wing stands today, there were conservatories put up by James Buchanan. It's about the only constructive thing he did. Uh, as president, and T.R. characteristically said, smash the glass houses. And down they came. Uh, I think he probably wanted to obliterate every trace of Buchanan's presence. He, he famously said that there are two kinds of presidents. There are Lincoln presidents and there are Buchanan presidents. And he left no one in any doubt which camp he belonged in. She almost single-handedly is responsible for the redesign uh, of the White House. Remember, Mrs. Benjamin Harrison had come to grief when she wanted to put that god-awful um, design that she had um, with, with wing. It looked like a palace. Um, Mrs. Roosevelt was much shrewder. The West, uh, the West Wing was built in the TR presidency because she said, this is first and foremost a home. It's a home for us and our children. Um, the office building, the working aspect of the White House, should be professionalized. And that's really where the West Wing and the Oval Office comes from. There was no Oval Office before T.R. But she, you know, she, um, on the other hand, she was no fashion plate. She, she was thrifty. The Roosevelt's did not have a lot of money, contrary to what people thought. T.R. lived by his pen. Um, one newspaper rather cattily said that Mrs. Roosevelt looked as if she dressed on $300 a year. Um, she clipped it out for her scrapbook. Um, she was very proud of the fact. But, um, you know, and of course, and, and the Roosevelt's brought with them the brood of, of children. Alice, you know, is a, is a larger than life figure, but I think uh, uh, the reality is that she and her father had a difficult, uh, rather distant relationship. Probably, and I'm no psychoanalyst, uh, grounded in the circumstances surrounding her birth and the death of her mother. He never mentioned her mother to her, which I find 
for a man who was so ebullient and outgoing and effusive, they were clearly chambers of the heart that were sealed forever. He never mentioned her in his autobiography. As if that was a sacred memory or too painful to deal with. And I think that had to have spilled over into the relationship uh, with Alice. The other the children were all hellraisers uh, from day one. Um, uh, you know, wasp hellraisers um, in, the, in, the, in the Roosevelt tradition. Uh, and they all had a great time. No presidential family ever enjoyed themselves more. One quick thing, again, sometimes it's funny to get your arms around the fact Edith Roosevelt also looked upon the White House, as did her husband, in a very modern way, as a showcase for the nation's great artists and writers. Um, they brought a cultural dimension which really was unprecedented. And the best, the best symbol of that and what it foreshadowed was the great uh, Pablo Casals, who performed at the Roosevelt White House and 60 years later performed at the Kennedy White House. Amazing story. Uh, as First Lady, Helen Taft literally changed the landscape of Washington, D.C. What? She changed you? more than that. Yeah. Helen Taft, again, someone very widely forgotten today. Helen Taft was, I would say, the first feminist president. By, well, there's a Freudian slip. Many people thought she was president. Um, and she did nothing to, to dispel the, uh, the illusion. On Inauguration Day, symbolic of this, she became the first first lady to ride back to the White House in the same carriage as her husband. Um, she was, it's pretty clear today, uh, exercising vicariously through will, an imperfect vessel, uh, her own political ambitions. And, but even more than that, politics aside, she said at the age of 22 that she for one did not think that marriage should be regarded as the ultimate achievement of womanhood. Um, which was a pretty radical thing to say, uh, even if you thought it, um, which I suspect a lot of married women did. The, um, maybe then and now. Anyway, um, Nellie Taft brought to the White House, well, her ambition to live there, first of all, was uh, somewhat unladylike. Remember, Mary Lincoln had been criticized uh, for openly uh, partnering with her husband in the political process and in the campaigning process. Um, Nellie attended the silver wedding anniversary of uh, their Ohio friends, Rutherford and Lucy Hayes. It was her first time in the White House, and she seems to have left the experience uh, dazzled and determined to repeat it. Um, and indeed, the great social event of the Taft presidency was the, uh, the, the silver wedding anniversary. She um, saw something in this young um, Cincinnati lawyer that I'm not sure he saw in himself. Um, history regards William Howard Taft as a, as a man perhaps of more judicial than political temperament. He said himself, I hate politics when I'm in it. He was thin-skinned, he was very sensitive, I mean, the qualities that made him lovable uh, and, and, and attracted a vast uh, army of admirers, even of people who didn't vote for him. He, he was like McKinley in, in that warmth, but without McKinley's political shrewdness. Um, in any event, it's a long story, but Helen was there every step of the way. He would have been very happy to have a Supreme Court seat. T.R., his dear friend at the time, offered it to him. Um, but Helen didn't want to be the wife of a Supreme Court justice. But to give you an idea of the character of, of both of these people, he got an appointment. He's America's first viceroy. Uh, remember, we had annexed the Philippines amidst much controversy. And there was an ongoing Iraq-like insurrection. Um, in the country. Thousands of Americans died. 
uh, a handful died in the Spanish-American War. It's the aftermath that um, transfixed America for several years. Taft, who was even then regarded as, uh, you know, kind of a natural administrator, and at the, at the same time a man with a talent for making people love him, uh, was asked by McKinley to become the first governor general of the Philippines, a thankless job under the best of circumstances, let alone in the midst of this insurrection. But one thing, the American military didn't want a civilian uh, governor general. Anyway, uh, they went dutifully, and they fell in love with the Philippines, and the Filipinos fell in love with them. And so much so <clears throat> that several years later, when T.R. offered him the job that he'd always wanted, he turned him down because he said his work in the Philippines was unfinished. They lived in a palace. Nellie Taft took to palaces. <laughs> <laughs> she learned there to entertain uh, on, a, on a scale and with a style that in many ways prepared her uh, for the White House. The great tragedy, of course, of the Taft presidency is Nellie's illness. Having achieved her, her life's ambition and ridden back on the inauguration day, uh, you know, to kind of figuratively uh, rub her enemy's noses in it, um, about three months into his presidency, she suffered a crippling stroke. And with characteristic fortitude, she, um, it, took, it took a while. She never fully regained her speech, but um, she was able a couple years later to preside over the silver wedding anniversary and to remind her husband endlessly uh, that she was right and he was wrong about Theodore Roosevelt, um, you know, who, of course, decided to run against his old friend uh, in, in the most, you know, the Ford-Reagan campaign was heated. The Taft-Roosevelt campaign was vicious. Um, each thought up new words to denounce the other. And Taft, who had a, a, a way of, uh, Taft was not a natural politician. Uh, Taft had a gift for malaprops, uh, for saying the wrong thing in ways that it would be quoted afterwards. For example, at the height of the campaign, um, he said, even a rat in a corner will fight back, referring to himself, uh, which is not exactly a presidential uh, statement. <laughs> Nellie, um, I think, you know, who knows? The old Greek word hubris. Um, she had aimed very high, and she had gotten what she wanted, only to discover that it really wasn't very satisfying. Um, fortunately, she regained enough of her health that when they left the White House, he went to do what he wanted to do. Um, he taught law at Yale for a while. He said that he was, he was offered a constitutional chair, and he said, given his girth, he, he thought it would be more appropriate if he was offered a constitutional sofa. Um, <laughs> he's the first ex-president to speak for money. He, he did all his own arrangements. He calculated that the railroad schedule was such that he could be in Iowa on a Saturday night speaking for $500 and be back in New Haven for his Monday morning class. Um, and then, of course, he, he got the job he always wanted in 1921 when Warren Harding made him Chief Justice. And Nellie, they had a mellow old age together. Um, she outlived him, and not surprisingly, she wrote a memoir. It's probably, I'm, I better not say this, but I will. Um, it's probably the, the, the best first lady memoir. Um, because of qualities, Nellie Taft had a rigorous mind and, uh, and a plain spoken habit, both of which served her well as a memoirist. You spoke uh, in response to a question last week about the Wilsons, but I don't want to leave that out tonight. Sure. So, t so talk a little bit about, about both Ellen and Edith Wilson. You know, um, 
Woodrow Wilson had two uneven terms. And you might say he had two uneven wives. Um, Wilson is a great master legislative strategist in his first term. Um, he foreshadows people like FDR and LBJ in terms of getting what he wants out of Congress. Um, in the second term, of course, came World War I, which we, in theory, won, but almost immediately the aftermath turned bitter uh, when Wilson himself, of course, fell ill and was unable to uh, fulfill the promise he'd made to the American people that this was a war to end war and to, uh, to assure that by joining the, the League of Nations. His wives were very different, each in her own way, a very impressive person. Um, Ellen, his first wife, was uh, a minister's daughter uh, and a very gifted artist who today probably would be a professional. Um, if you have a chance to, to see, if, if they go to the Wilson house, or periodically um, they'll loan uh, her paintings out, uh, you'll be impressed. She was a very gifted, uh, not so much a portraitist, but a landscape painter. She adored her husband, who needed to be adored. I mean, he, we think of Wilson as a chilly, remote academic, um, and, and that was that side to him. But it coexisted with an enormous emotional need. And he liked women um, a lot. Um, to this day, there's a debate over the nature of the relationship. He, he would uh, periodically, uh, he discovered Bermuda as a getaway place. Remember, he'd had serious health issues early in his life. Uh, he'd had a stroke uh, before he was 50. Actually, he was urged by his doctors to retire when he was president of Princeton. And he needed to say, didn't do that. But he discovered Bermuda and fell in love with the place. And, uh, and he didn't take his wife with him. And he met this charming, if slightly eccentric, and very troubled, um, I guess soon to be divorced, woman named Mrs. Peck. If you've ever heard the phrase, Peck's bad boy, it's a colloquialism uh, referring to Wilson by his political enemies who were eager to believe the worst uh, of the president. Um, to this day, we don't know exactly what the relationship was. We know that Wilson, at one point, apologized to Ellen. He, he brought this up, and, and, uh, which makes him a pretty unusual adulterer, if, uh, if that's the case. Ellen did not live very long in the White House. She, she had her own significant impact on the place, the Rose Garden. It's Ellen Wilson who uh, created the Rose Garden that, of course, would be reinvented by Jacqueline Kennedy. And um, she could see the garden being planted from her bedroom window on the second floor of the White House, where she died uh, in August of 1914, 100 years ago, the, the same week that World War I broke out. And I, you, I mean, you know, Wilson was just shattered. And as I said before, he, he, uh, he expressed at that time the hope that somebody would assassinate him. Um, now, that said, within eight or nine months, uh, he was courting the second Mrs. Wilson, Edith Bowling Galt, who was a 42-year-old widow of uh, Washington's leading jeweler. In fact, Galt and Sons only closed about three or four years ago. Hmm. So she had, she had plenty of money. She was an independent woman. She, uh, her one claim to fame is she thought to be the first woman in Washington to drive herself around town, which was kind of a emblematic of her approach to life. She wasn't at all sure she wanted to be married to the president. Again, the debate goes on. What was her motive? There are people who look upon her as a, uh, not a gold digger, but maybe a power digger. Um, and, and, and let's face it, it had to be flattering to the president of the United States courting you. 
and, and, and Wilson didn't court like most people. Wilson wrote reams of love letters, um, extraordinary love letters, sometimes two or three a day. Um, clearly, there was some emotional release involved, uh, and she eventually uh, swallowed her doubts. He told her about Mrs. Peck, and briefly, uh, there's some question as to whether it would destroy the relationship. In fact, it made it stronger, the fact that he had been so candid, and um, she decided that she would take the plunge. Um, and thereafter, she became, I, you know, I once heard a um, historian describe her as the worst first lady in American history, and I don't know what they based that on. Um, there was the notion that perhaps, you know, she unduly influenced her husband. Um, I don't think that's true. Um, in fact, he made her a partner. They had desks, they shared desks, and he shared papers of state, of speeches that he was writing, diplomatic correspondence, I mean, top secret, you know, during the war. Um, in that sense, she was, emotionally, she was a co-president. But people who think that she was the first female president uh, because of his illness and her subsequent um, oversight of the presidency. She controlled access. That's important, but it's not what we associate with the presidency. Um, there was a wonderful story. The, during World War I, of course, conservation, food conservation, uh, was all the rage. The Wilsons observed meatless Mondays and wheatless Wednesdays, uh, as dictated by his food administrator, a man named Herbert Hoover, who, who got the job, uh, not that he wanted it, but after feeding Belgium uh, for four years. And he was part of the war cabinet with the Under Secretary of the Navy, a young man named Franklin D. Roosevelt. And they were neighbors in Washington and good friends for a while, um, as were their wives. But anyway, part of the conservation effort, even then, PR was cranking up. You had uh, radio would soon be on the scene. This was kind of the golden age of, uh, of advertising. And um, people who think that the White House today sort of invents the, um, the constant campaign, if you will, uh, should take a look at the, at the Wilson presidency. One of the sort of stunts that the, the president and first lady submitted to, to set a good example, for their countrymen was, they, they gave up their automobile for the duration of the war. So they were taken to church every Sunday by a horse-drawn wagon. Um, and then they got the idea that um, to save labor and to aid the Red Cross, um, they would install a flock of sheep on the White House grounds. And this was fine until the sheep began to eat uh, what they weren't supposed to. Um, the garden and uh, shrubs and, and anyway, it was a gesture of sacrifice that wound up costing more than it saved. And in the meantime, WAGs in Washington dubbed Mrs. Wilson Little Bo Peep. <laughs> she was at his side, oh, need to say, uh, he had a short three-year ex-presidency Tragically, you might even say pathetically, he had convinced himself that the Democrats would nominate him in 1920 for a third term and in 1924. Um, and, you know, he, he physically, mentally wasn't up to it. And her role as an incredibly devoted wife was, in a sense, to protect the cocoon around him. Um, he never came close to recovering from the stroke. But she created a life, for example, if you go to the Wilson House in Washington today, um, his bedroom is as nearly as possible a duplicate of that in the White House. 
because as you often said, invalids are very sensitive to their environment. And, she, and he'd loved the Lincoln bed. He'd slept in the Lincoln bed in the White House. So she had a replica made. And the surprise, when he came home on Inauguration Day, 1921, rejected, I mean, the American people wanted nothing to do with uh, Wilsonism after 1920. Um, he was seen as a symbol of a failed war, and worse, in effect, uh, a dishonest one. So he went back to S Street, and lo and behold, he found himself in a room that was exactly like uh, his old one. Um, and that's where he died in February 1924, while hundreds of people knelt in the streets outside in prayer. And his last word was Edith. Okay. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt uh, is obviously a figure that deserves a fair amount of discussion. So can we start out, can you just describe her life growing up and her marriage before what? they I, entered the White House? Absolutely. But first, let me just briefly mention her predecessor, who um, was her friend, and in some ways almost a role model, and a woman who we have all forgotten, uh, and someone who really, if any 20th century first lady, a substantive figure deserves reintroduction, it's Lou Henry Hoover. Um, first woman to get a geology degree at Stanford, which is where she met her husband. Um, they honeymooned in China, where he had been hired by the government at the ripe age of 23, 24, to find gold. Um, their honeymoon coincided with the Boxer Rebellion. Lou used to get up every morning and sweep the bullets off her front porch. She thought it was very thrilling. She wrote to her friend, this is one of the great seizures of the age. What a privilege to be part of it. Um, she narrowly escaped falling victim. They had an adventurous life. Uh, he became the great engineer, the world's foremost mining engineer. Before he was the great humanitarian, the man who fed a billion people in over 50 countries. And Lou was not just along for the ride. Lou was his equal. One thing, and then we'll go on to Mrs. Roosevelt. They, in those days, they actually, someone once calculated, they actually spent three years of their lives on ocean liners. He had offices on three continents. And uh, they lived in London at the beginning of World War I. And they had two children. And Lou, first of all, Lou designed a cradle for use exclusively on an ocean liner. And by the time Herbert Jr. was eight years old, he'd been around the world five times. But it's how they spent their time that tells you what was unusual about this woman and about this couple. And, and tragically couldn't bear fruit in the, in the Depression years. Um, she'll always be a kind of what if first lady. But um, they wanted to pass the time usefully. And that meant intellectually. And so they decided they would translate the 16th century Latin mining scholar Agricola into English. A 556 page book was the result of this. He said she did all the work. She had the linguistic gifts and he got the gold medal. But, uh, you know, that was symbolic. One other thing, when Mrs. Hoover died in 1944, by then, they were living at the Waldorf Towers in New York. And the president went to her desk and opened it and found it was stuffed with uncashed checks from people who, during the Depression and thereafter, had written to the First Lady appealing for financial help. And she had very quietly uh, done what she could, 
uh, but didn't bother to cash when the, when the, when the, when the, when the, when the help was repaid. Um, and that, in some ways, is symbolic. She, it was an act of kindness, um, which never, for which she never got credit. And there's a lot about Mrs. Hoover, for which she never got credit. But she was a good friend of Eleanor Roosevelt's. And um, in many ways, I think, I think as always, Eleanor Roosevelt is the first lady that Lou Hoover would have been had, of course, her attention not been totally focused on, on the emergency of the Depression. For example, she's the first first lady to speak on the radio, which, of course, Mrs. Roosevelt then um, institutionalized uh, $500 a minute. She got 300,000 letters one year. She had bigger radio audiences than her husband. Um, two days after his inauguration, she um, stood outside the Red Room with a, a box of candied fruit uh, and convened the first press conference ever held by a first lady. Now, um, only women were allowed at Mrs. Roosevelt's press conferences. Um, so it was a sexist innovation in some ways. But uh, it was fascinating. She was outspoken, um, not only in what she said, but in what she did. She welcomed black sharecroppers to the White House. She um, had an annual garden party for um, female government workers so that they could take time off from work uh, and come and see the White House. Um, her cousin, Alice, who had grown up to have a not altogether attractive, rather waspish tongue, um, was famous for her imitation of Eleanor, um, which was not flattering, needless to say. But she recognized <coughs> Eleanor's sincerity and her place in history. Um, she said, never had anyone so comforted the distressed and distressed the comfortable. <laughs> Which is not a bad epitaph if you stop to think about it. Of course, the, uh, the, the relationship between the Roosevelts is one of endless fascination and to some degree speculation, as is, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> as is her relationship with Lorena Hickok. Um, it, was, it was only in the 1980s when a cache of letters were discovered. They had been left to the Roosevelt Library, clearly with the intent of being made public um, uh, by Lorena Hickok's heirs. She was an AP reporter and a damn good one um, by all accounts, just um, a remarkable um, journalist who had the misfortune to befriend um, the candidate's wife. And, and of course, in some ways, that disqualified her from, from covering the White House. For her, you know, I think the relationship was in, intense and, and ultimately frustrating. Um, it's very clear that it, there was an intense emotional relationship. I don't think it matters very much at this stage whether it uh, expressed itself physically, but no one reading the letters uh, can come, it seems to me, to any other conclusion. Um, you know, the, these were two women who um, needed well, each other and who, for a while, regarded each other as um, a partner. The amazing thing is in that first year, the first lady of the land and her lady friend could get in an automobile and incognito travel the land. Or at least they hoped they could. They got to the West Coast. And of course, Mrs. Roosevelt was recognized and it really, it, it was sort of the, the beginning of the end of the, uh, of the intimacy that they had, that they had enjoyed. Um, 
to this day, if you want, if you want to understand the Depression and, and experience it vicariously, as people in places like Kansas and the Dust Bowl um, did, the single best source are Lorena Hickok's first-hand reports um, that she made for the New Deal, because she, in effect, lost her job as a journalist and was hired to employ those same journalistic talents. And it, it's a remarkable document. Um, powerful. Mrs. Roosevelt was a great lady. Uh, she was a great first lady. Um, but I'm not sure even her warmest admirers would consider her, and the president for that matter, terribly successful at parenting. And it's really, you know, it's, it's the Roosevelt, the Roosevelts are the first modern White House family in a lot of ways for better and ill. And, and the children really reflect that fact. On the one hand, they resented living in a goldfish bowl. On the other, some of them, frankly, couldn't resist uh, the urge to profit or promote themselves. And um, it caused all kinds of controversy. And sure, you should say, look, you know, my kids are off limits. But in even the media market of the 1930s and 40s, there was no such thing as being off limits. Um, I lost track of how many divorces and remarriages, um, but they're all multiple. And um, I think Mrs. Roosevelt herself felt some degree of guilt. Um, on the other hand, I'm happy to say, uh, there's a happy ending to the story because she turns out to have been the world's greatest grandmother. Just wonderful. She'd take, you know, her grandkids off to Paris, you know, on a whim and show her, you know, sights that she had, had seen as a child. And, and I, I mean, she must have been, she must have been a remarkable presence, first of all. I mean, I, I'm sure there's some of you who can remember. I mean, once you heard that voice, you never forgot it. Um, but she trained herself. She worked to make herself over, not just professionally. You know, as a young woman born to privilege in New York society, um, she partook of fashionable anti-Semitism. She talked about darkies like the others of her class. What makes her story I think a continuing source of, of inspiration to many people is that she demonstrated the capacity that hopefully all of us have to outgrow our limitations and to come to a full appreciation of the rich diversity of this country. And she certainly did that. Um, there's never been a first lady who was more polarizing or more popular and there's certainly never been a first lady, except I would say Betty Ford, who had life outside the White House that was arguably as substantive and historically significant. Um, she virtually wrote the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, a document we don't pay much attention to today, but which is the founding charter of the United Nations, which of course was FDR's great dream to succeed where Wilson had failed. And she was a tough cookie. Um, she could go toe to toe with Molotov. She could, you know, she could out sit them, outweight them. Uh, you know, the woman in her 70s uh, working at three o'clock in the morning, and finally even the Soviets gave up and went home. You know, obstructionism <coughs> has its limit. Um, she she really was an extraordinary person. It was almost as if, you know, she came into her own in a way, after the president's death. And um, one last thing, she, she remained one of the most powerful figures in the Democratic Party. Um, an icon, really, for millions. But, you know, she was not perfect. Um, one of the more embarrassing things is, I'm, probably, I'm sure it's on YouTube, to watch the elderly first lady of the world, as she was known, doing margarine commercials. Um, 
she didn't keep the money. It wasn't for the money. The money all went to her causes. But, I, you know, it's not something... When people think of Eleanor Roosevelt as, as the um, forerunner, the role model for everything that followed, not in everything. There are some things... I, it's hard to imagine Michelle Obama promoting uh, butter, margarine, whatever. Um, but it was a different time. In 1960, her candidate was not John F. Kennedy. She remembered Kennedy's father, Joe, who of course had been an isolationist of isolationists and who FDR at one point made FDR so angry the last time they met. And FDR was unflappable. Um, and he said, get that man out of here. I'm going to throw him out the window. Um, and Mrs. Roosevelt had, if not the voting instincts of an elephant, she had the memory of one. Um, she told Carmine DiSapio, the, the Tammany Hall boss, who knifed her son in the race for governor of New York in 1954, I won't forget. And she did. She, and Carmine, it took eight years where Carmine DiSapio was uh, knifed himself. Um, it, her, her great you know, political love in the last years of her life was Adlai Stevenson. Stevenson was her kind of Democrat. Eloquent, charming, um, worldly, um, intellectual. He, he appeared to be an intellectual, he was not, but, you know, thoughtful. And um, three times she went to bat for Stevenson. And in 1960, she wanted, she'd hoped that the Democrats would draft him a third time and um, didn't take. She and JFK had a meeting at Val Kill, her cottage that she built two miles from Mama's house, as she referred to it. And uh, it was interesting. They said JFK came away smitten. And uh, there is an amazing photograph of four American presidents. Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy and Johnson um, at her funeral in 1962, uh, which tells you something about the, the power she still retained. Um, okay. I have one final question, then we're going to open it up to audience uh, Q&A. So be thinking about uh, what you might like to ask Richard, and remember to hold your hand up and wait for one of our students with a cordless mic to uh, come by. Uh, let's conclude or conclude this part of it, Richard, with um, Mrs. Truman. She was pretty strongly contrasted to Eleanor Roosevelt. Oh, yeah. She was the un-Eleanor. Uh, you know, and yet it's interesting because it's the surface things in which they differed. She didn't have press conferences. Um, not because she was shy or retiring. Um, I think she, well, she was a traditionalist in many ways, but she was a very strong and strong-willed woman. Um, Harry Truman said she was the only love of his life, and there's every evidence that that's true, that he fell in love with her in Sunday school. The feeling was not reciprocated. Um, she turned him down at least once, um, in part because her mother didn't think much of Harry Truman, a condition that never changed. Um, her mother didn't think that uh, Harry Truman was good enough. Um, of course, Truman you know, came from very modest origins. Uh, Truman never owned a home. That was his mother-in-law's house that you visit in Independence. Uh, that's what, that was Bess's house. But uh, you know, Truman uh, grew up really dirt poor on a farm. Uh, couldn't go to college, to his great regret. I think he's the only 20th century president who, who didn't go to college. But he compensated for that. I, I think, um, for whatever reason, you know, he was a voracious reader, especially of history. And um, he was a man of, of, humanity, of, of such honesty that he could you know, lie down with fleas or worse in the shape of the Pendergast machine and, and get up and, and be acclaimed as 
an honest politician, which in Missouri was a <laughs> cause for comment. Um, <laughs> and Bess, you know, it's interesting. Bess doesn't seem to have been very interested in his political career. Um, when he was president, Bess spent as much time as she could in independence. She much preferred the company of her bridge club in independence to uh, state dinners. And of course, she had an excuse because, as you know, the White House was about to fall down and uh, Congress appropriated funds to, uh, and there was serious consideration giving to tearing the place down and replacing it with a new modern, you know, latter-day version of Mrs. Harrison's White House. And to his eternal credit, Truman, the student of history, uh, refused to even consider it. Um, but, you know, he paid a price because, first of all, the Trumans were moved across the street to Boyer House. Um, secondly, you know, Bess wasn't there a whole lot. Again, it's amazing to think, can you imagine today if the First Lady spent half her time, you know, out of Washington? Um, and they're sad letters. Um, they were, the Trumans were wonderful letter writers. And you can imagine all Truman's pungent qualities of expression uh, translated well to paper. And uh, one Christmas, Christmas Day, he was alone at the White House. And she was back in Independence with Margaret. And he sat down, he wrote this, frankly, self-pitying, but understandable letter. He was a man with the weight of the world on his shoulders and without the woman he loved. And um, wrote the letter and then decided better. He flew out to Independence. <laughs> Um, they, you know, they had, this, they had the, the White House, the Little White House, at Key West, which Truman loved. Um, and that was his getaway. He could go and he could play poker and drink bourbon and play some more poker. Um, and need to say, Bess, I think, went once. It was not her environment, you know. But, you know, in some ways, you step back, it, it, it's almost a perfect marriage. Each understood the other. Each set aside, you know, these, this, this is a line I won't cross. These are the areas, you know, they're sacrosanct. I mean, it worked. They, they were a love match. Which is, I mean, one of the things to come out of this series is the challenges, the difficulties, the ordeals, the losses, the tests that attend life in the White House most of the time have forged closer bonds between the president and first lady. And I think that's in part because if you're president, you know, who do you trust ultimately? Who is your ultimate supporter uh, and friend and ally uh, and uh, an advisor? And um, there have been exceptions. We have mentioned the Coolidge's. I'm a Coolidge fan. I love Grace. I uh, admire Cal. Um, she said afterwards, privately, a couple of times she almost divorced him. And the worst time, she said, was in the White House, following the death of their son. And you can imagine, I mean, it's not hard to put yourself, I mean, he was a very difficult man, uh, very controlling. Um, he ordered all the White House groceries from the nearest Piggly Wiggly store. Um, he, fired the, he fired the housekeeper when he found that she had served six hams to 60 guests. Uh, that was unthrifty by Vermont standards. He prohibited Grace from bobbing her hair or going aloft in an airplane. I mean, there were all kinds of things. He bought, on the other hand, he adored her. He just, he, like lots of men, he just wasn't very good at verbalizing it. Um, he was himself, I think, emotionally stilted. And, um, and he had tragedy in his life and lost and was very sensitive. So poor Mrs. Coolidge, he meant well. <coughs> he bought her clothes. 
The one extravagance in his life was Grace's wardrobe. He always wanted her looking her best. And that was fine, except he had terrible taste in hats. <laughs> he would buy these huge picture hats, you know, appropriate to the Victorian era, and then want Grace to, to wear them. And, you know, she was a long-suffering lover. And <coughs> he never got over the death of his son. I think it began a physical decline. He died at the age of 60. Um, she was, I think she had more resources in some ways of, of faith. She also wrote poetry. She's a very gifted poet. And um, there's some, some of the most moving uh, poetry, certainly in White House history, that she wrote inspired by Calvin Jr. When he died, she sincerely grieved. And then she got on with life. And she bobbed her hair, and she got up in an airplane, and went around the world, and bought clothes that she wanted to wear, uh, wore slacks. My God, Calvin would have, you know, divorced her. But, um, <coughs> and her great love was baseball. She, had, she loved the Boston Red Sox. Was always, on opening day, was always in a special box at Fenway Park. And at the end of her life, the last year, you knew it was near the end of her life because uh, she couldn't go. So, uh, but the Red Sox uh, sent her roses and dedicated the game to her. Um, remarkable woman. And, um, well, she, another classic instance of someone who the more you know about her, the more you want to know. And uh, the, riches, the rich reward of, uh, of curiosity um, where the First Ladies are concerned. Okay, let's go to audience Q&A. Uh, raise a hand and uh, we've got Anthony, somebody right here in front of you. Uh, thank you very much for your um, lecture. It was very informative. Uh, one of the things, perhaps the only thing that really surprised me that you said was uh, your underestimation of Mrs. Wilson's role in influencing him, particularly during his illness. Uh, <coughs> is that a, now a revisionist theory? Because I always, through my reading, understood that it was probably uh, not just access of individuals, but also of the information he got and the spin that it was put to him by she and Colonel House in the absence of uh, his contact with very many other people. Okay. Um, uh, uh, yes, to some degree it is revisionist, uh, based upon we now have access to Dr. Grayson's papers. Dr. Grayson was much more than the White House physician. And in fact, it was not Colonel House who uh, actually Mrs. Roosevelt, or Mrs. Roosevelt, Mrs. Wilson came to despise. Uh, but her ally in this was uh, Dr. Grayson. And, um, you know, you can argue it either way. Access to a president is power. There's no doubt about it. But it's not the initiative power that we associate with presidential leadership. She wasn't proposing legislation. She wasn't passing judgment on appointments. She was trying to keep her husband alive. And, and therefore control the number of people whom he saw. There was nothing conspiratorial about it. And I don't think anything particularly uh, reeking of personal ambition. I, again, it's, it's easy to forget, first and foremost, I think now is then, but certainly then, that the, you know, these are human beings. Um, she'd been through this remarkable whirlwind of, of events with Woodrow Wilson. But to her, he wasn't the president of the United States. You know, he was the man she loved. And um, so I think, you know, no two people interpret the same documentary evidence uh, the same. But I think, for example, uh, uh, the Scott Berg uh, biography of Wilson, recently published, I think, offers a much more nuanced uh, view of what her role was. It was unique. It's never been repeated, thank God. I mean, 
One of the interesting things, you know, Dwight Eisenhower did more than anyone else to demystify presidential health. And it, because Ike, as a young cadet at West Point, had marched in Woodrow Wilson's inaugural parade. And he was of the generation that vividly remembered how the White House had, in effect, tried to cover up the severity of the president's illness. The remarkable thing is the press went along. You should read the, the New York Times you know, coverage. I mean, they swallowed whole the story that, you know, greatly minimized the extent of the president's uh, incapacity. Today, uh, there's no doubt he would reside. And, and sadly, had he resigned, then I think his historical reputation would be higher. He would be seen as a, as a victim, as a martyr, really, for the principles uh, that he espoused above all the League of Nations. Okay, we've got a question back here. You talked about the importance of, of the husbands of the First Ladies, but you really didn't get into the importance of Franklin in Eleanor's life. Well, there's no doubt that um, that's, that's a complicated subject. Um, I'm not sure we have evenings enough to do justice to, the, to, the, to that relationship, which, uh, which is a fascinating one, and obviously a very consequential one for American history. Um, but it's, it's also impossible to get away from the fact, in some ways, her independence flowed out of his betrayal. I don't know what else you call it. Um, his affair with Lucy Mercer, her uh, social secretary. I often say, you know, the, the conventional take on the Roosevelt story is that FDR was this sort of high-toned aristocrat son um, who was remade, reshaped. Iron entered his soul as, as a result of his paralysis. Uh, he learned empathy um, and to identify with wife's victims. And all of that's true. But, but there's another factor, I think, almost as true in terms of knocking him off his pedestal, in his own words. And that was the heartache and the pain and the suffering uh, and the shame, all, all surrounding uh, his affair with Lucy. What it taught him was that fundamentally decent people um, in the throes of their emotions can behave in ways that they themselves would disapprove of uh, in, 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 in normal times. Eleanor offered him a divorce. Um, and Mama promised to cut him off financially. More to the point, Lucy Mercer, who, by the way, appears to be a perfectly... I don't know if I'll say innocent in all this, but I mean, Lucy wanted to do the right thing. Lucy was a devout Catholic. And in those days, you didn't, you didn't marry a divorced man. So there's some, there's some question as to whether Lucy ever felt free had, had FDR risked, been willing to risk his political reputation. And in the end, it, was, it came down to a combination of things. I don't, he knew that his career would be over. Um, his finances would be shaky at best. And, and, you know, he was not a man who wanted to inflict pain on his wife and children. And to their lasting credit, I think, they, they didn't just patch things up. They forged a new and, in some ways, historic relationship. Uh, and Eleanor was set free in some ways to explore. I mean, you know, that's, she began teaching school in the Lower East Side. She became very involved in the women's movement, in labor, you know, long before that was certainly fashionable. She, in her own activities, anticipated the New Deal by a decade or more. So, you know, it's a, as I said, it's a complicated relationship. She said after he died, that she mourned him more than she would have thought, which I think is terribly revealing and 
and sad at the same time. Okay, we have a question over here. Yes, I have a question regarding Alice Roosevelt, um, Teddy's oldest daughter. In her adult life living in Washington, what was some of her influence of the city? Was it only social or some political influence? That's a great question. I uh, had decided while well, I was waiting to hear from Harvard whether they had the good judgment to accept me uh, in the spring of 1971. And on March 17th, 16th of that year, Tom Dewey died. And um, the former governor of New York and twice candidate for president, who Mrs. Roosevelt, of course, had immortalized as the little man on the wedding cake. I mean, a line that just stuck. I mean, Dewey looked like a doll. I mean, he was a little short and a little prim mustache. And, you know, if you could think of a benevolent Hitler, I mean, that's sort of what, uh, <laughs> what you know, Dewey... Dewey uh, communicated to a lot of people. Other people thought he looked like Charlie Chaplin without the humor. Um, I thought, you know, I won't say I thought he was a great man. I thought he was a greatly misunderstood and certainly not well known. And on that day, I had an epiphany. I said, if I got into Harvard, I would write my thesis on Dewey. And that turned into a book and so on and so on. Anyway, so <laughs> one of the first people I contacted was Alice Roosevelt Longworth who by that time was a cheerfully malevolent old woman living in a castle in DuPont Circle, straight out of Charles Adams. And she was famous for um, her waspish wit. You know, in the parlor was the, the, the pillow that said, if you don't have anything good to say about someone, come over and sit with me. <laughs> um, <laughs> which sort of sums up now, what people didn't know is, I mean, to this day, you know, there are those who say, why didn't Alice Roosevelt Longworth emulate Eleanor Roosevelt and pursue meaningful causes and devote her life to, you know, substantive events instead of being a, a wit and a, you know, coveted dinner party guest and, and the like. And the fact is, each woman played to her her strengths. Um, she was not politically influential. Um, she, by the way, is very conservative politically. She was a Taft Republican, which is ironic, you know, given the relationship. Um, she had a rather tragic marriage to the Speaker of the House, a man who liked to drink more than work. Um, and uh, was not the father of her child. Um, she wrote a newspaper column for a while. Um, it bombed. Turned out she had only so many witticisms. But anyway, to finish my story, I, talk, I, I wrote to her, and she, very kindly, she wrote me back, uh, said, uh, give me a call at this number at this time. And I did. She answered the phone. And I will never forget her honesty. Because she said, I, you know, the little man on the wedding cake, for which she is immortalized. She said, that was an original to me. I heard it in my dentist's office. <laughs> <laughs> so history gets written or unwritten. But that was our only contact. But I tell you, for a kid, you know, right out of college, it was, it was pretty heady stuff. OK, do we have, uh, we got a question up here, Anthony? Oh, we got a question back there first. Thanks, Quinn. Um, um, about Margaret Truman, um, I'm just curious to know who you thought, which of her parents you thought influenced her life. Uh, she went on to become a, a writer. Yeah. Um, and um, I've always been curious about which parents she <coughs> modeled her life after. Well, you know, it's a good question. I mean, I, I don't mean to be evasive, but I mean, you know, she, it's telling that she wrote books about each of her parents. Um, and actually, some, I mean, you know, they were both kind of no-nonsense, you know, the, 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 the wonderful story about Bess when they first moved into the White House. And um, she asked the steward for an old-fashioned. And he brought it to her. 
He said, oh, no, no, no. That's, you know, it needs more what, bourbon. Did you put it old fashioned. Anyway, it took three tries before the guy poured straight bourbon <laughs> in the glass. He said, ah, now that's an old fashioned, you know? <laughs> and, you know, she was old fashioned in some ways. I mean, she's, you know, it, again, it's unfair for us to impose, you know, our image of perfection or significance on earlier generations. Uh, you know, Bess Truman was a product of her times, just as much as any of us are. And I would only hope that posterity would be more generous than we often are in assessing. She, Mamie Eisenhower would, uh, would, would be in the same category. Uh, you know, a woman who uh, was in her own way as, as much a fashion plate as Jackie Kennedy in the 60s. It's just the 50s were very different from the 60s, and we tend to want to remember the 60s more. Um, but, you know, Mrs. Eisenhower is condescended to, that's the only way to put it, by people who uh, mistake the fact that, you know, yeah, she liked to spend mornings in bed, and she never missed as the world turns. But, you know, she also shook a thousand hands a day. You try that, that's work. And she'd made 27 households in her marriage for Ike. And that was what life was about, Ike and uh, the children. But so call her a traditionalist, there are worse things to be. Okay, we have another question right here. Richard, do you think Eleanor was aware of the betrayal by Anna, her daughter, in regard to the Lucy Mercer affair? Yeah. In, in fact, uh, yeah, the brief, brief background. Um, on top of the normal reaction of a, of a widow um, who had learned that her husband had just died, uh, Mrs. Roosevelt went to Warm Springs, and uh, which she had not frequented, maybe for the same reason that Bess Truman stayed away from Key West. Um, but anyway, um, she learned through a tactless relation um, that Lucy Mercer had been with the president when he died. And um, perfectly innocent, I mean, those, those fires, I think, had been banked uh, for a long time. And, uh, but, you know, this was a man all but crushed under the burdens of the presidency, who had been bearing those burdens, you know, for 12 years, who was physically exhausted, and who simply wanted someone around him who could take his mind off the agonies of his daily existence. And, you know, Eleanor wasn't that. She had really never been that. She was his conscience. Um, Lucy was his escape. But you could imagine how this, because one thing I didn't say, one of the conditions of the Roosevelt marriage continuing was Franklin had to promise never to see Lucy again. So, to Mrs. Roosevelt, that was a sacred pledge. And within days, she discovered that, in fact, not only had he seen Lucy on a number of occasions, but that their visits had been facilitated by her daughter, Anna. Mrs. Roosevelt was out on the road, and um, a desperately lonely, dying president um, was grateful for any reminder of old times and anything that took him away from the present. And Anna saw that. And you, you could, you know, you could debate it. Was it an act of compassion or was it an act of cruelty? Uh, I suppose it depends on which Roosevelt you're talking about. It 
estranged the two women for some time. But, you know, to her great credit, Mrs. Roosevelt had a, 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 a huge heart and, and a capacity to forgive. Um, and I think like lots of people, lots of parents, um, as you get older and experience more of life and maybe see how your own children are faring, uh, you, you probably develop a certain magnanimity, not only toward them, but toward yourself and your imperfections when you were their age. And she forgave Anna, and, and they, and they reestablished their, their closeness. Anna, of course, was her only daughter. And, uh, but it's, again, you know, it, it, the, the whole theme of this subject and of this series is the humanity, first and foremost, that is often lost in the official trappings um, and power grabbing of Washington. First and foremost, these are husbands and wives and mothers and fathers. And uh, that's a part of this story, I think, that often gets left out of the history book. Okay, I think we have time for one last question. We have one right over here. <coughs> You've said something about every first lady from McKinley to Eisenhower, but you've not mentioned one. Can you tell us something about Mrs. Harding? Sure. And her relationship with her husband and some of the uh, black clouds over his death. Well, okay, now we come to one of the more unconventional love matches. Um, two people who didn't particularly love each other, but who turned out to be a perfect partnership. Um, Florence Harding was uh, a very gifted businesswoman who contributed significantly to the success of Warren Harding's newspaper, the Marion Star. And it was on, the, on that newspaper, typical of Ohio at the time, that he based his political career. State Senate, Lieutenant Governor, United States Senate, and ultimately the presidency in 1920. Along the way, uh, he had a wandering eye and it was kept busy um, in Marion and elsewhere. I mean, it's how he juggled all of the affairs, not necessarily of state, um, is, a, is a, a source of continuing wonder. Um, his, his, apparently, his, his real love was, well, Florence, because we're talking about first ladies. Mrs. Hardy was five years older. Her father was sort of the, the, the dominant local factor economically, you know, small town power broker who um, cut her off when she married Warren Harding. She had already, she was divorced. She's the first divorced woman to be first lady. Um, and in fact, more recently, talk about uh, changing views. There is evidence that in fact it was a common law marriage. She had a son that ended badly. Um, and yet here's a woman, talk about the 20s woman, the new woman. Um, she is in many, many ways a forerunner of today's single mother. Cut off by her father, she had the gumption, to use an old-fashioned word, to support herself. She supported herself by teaching piano to be no doubt talentless youth of Marion. <coughs> and, um, and she pursued Warren. <coughs> There's no doubt. She, uh, she set her cap for him. And she was, she was shrewd. Um, they were married. It's a, it's a curious marriage. Um, look at pictures of them, you know. Some people just don't look like they shouldn't be together. I mean, some people look like they were, you know, born to be together. Um, he called her the Duchess. We don't know what she called him. Um, but she was, she was aware of his wandering eye. Anyway, the, the, the problem could have become a catastrophe because in 1920, the Republicans nominated him as a dark horse candidate 
when all the front runners knocked themselves off. Now, Mrs. Harding, long before Nancy Reagan, Mrs. Harding consulted a Washington astrologer, Madame Marsha, uh, who had an office in DuPont Circle. And she t attempted to disguise herself. And she went there, and Madame Marsha may or may not have been good at predicting the future, but she certainly knew senators' wives when she saw them. And in any event, the story goes, true story, that Madame Marsha predicted that her husband would become president of the United States and that he would die in office, um, which is not a terribly cheerful <laughs> forecast. Um, but anyway, it happened. And um, Mrs. Harding knew, well, when Harding died, Harding died, uh, we think of a, a heart attack or a stroke, we're not sure, in August 1923 in a San Francisco hotel. He was coming back from a trip to Alaska. She was with him. No one else, else was in the room. Even then, conspiracy theorists abounded because, of course, Teapot Dome was about to burst open. And so the whispering was that the First Lady had murdered her husband so that he wouldn't have to endure the public humiliation of the scandal. Now, you know, a lot of unkind things have been said about Florence Harding. That's about the most far-fetched. And, and unfortunately, it found an audience. It was sort of the tabloid press of its day. Uh, there was a best-selling book written by a scurrilous character named Gaston B. Means. I mean, you couldn't make that up. It's, you know, <laughs> Gaston B. Means. Anyway, you need the B for full effect. Um, you know, the strange death of President Harding. And um, there were people perfectly willing to believe, along with the story about Nan Britton and the illegitimate child and, and all of this. Harding, you know, his 150th birthday is next year. I don't think it will be widely observed, <laughs> but you know, he, deserves, he deserves a fresh look. The, the Budget Bureau, can you believe it? Before 1920, there was no Budget Bureau. There was no presidential control over federal spending. Every department basically submitted its wishes to uh, Congress. Well, talk about a, a, a presidential authority. Harding modernized the office, created the Budget Bureau. Um, the Washington Naval Conference, which pursued disarmament after World War I in a way that has never been equaled. Um, I, you know, there's, there, there are a lot of things to the Harding presidency, uh, but, but it's been overshadowed by gossip and rumors, some pretty salacious, some pretty sensational. Um, Mrs. Harding went home to Marion after the president's death, and she died less than a year later. And by that time, the scandals were uh, in full flow. Nevertheless, 600,000 American school children had donated pennies and dimes and to build the Hardings a memorial. The problem was they couldn't get anyone to dedicate it. Um, Coolidge didn't want to have you know, anything to do with it. And in the end, it was Herbert Hoover um, who went out to Marion several years after it was built to belatedly dedicate the Hardings' tomb. And there they rest um, in enforced intimacy uh, <laughs> through eternity. And on th that note, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, thank you for a fascinating you evening. <laughs> I want to I want to share something, everybody, because so many of you have said, "Well, now you and Richard go over what you're going to talk about." No, I tell everybody, no, nobody at the Dole Institute knows the question. So, you know, all you do is you just ask him questions and. He has this fabulous memory, so uh, enjoy one last chance uh, uh, tomorrow night. So come out, hear about the contemporary First Ladies. You'll really enjoy it. Thank you all for coming out Thank tonight. You.